you on a good Friday. And I'm telling you this for that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I want to bring a special warm welcome who are on holiday and joining us. Thank you for taking the time out. Um, we are that you are allowing us into your home. And for those of you who came in person, thank you. Thank you for being here. Amen. We know it's going to be worth your while. We know that God's really going to really going to touch your life um, over this weekend. I want to say, and you cannot have Sunday without Friday. There was a death, there was a burial, and there's a resurrection. And that's why we have Easter weekend, family. So for three days, Jesus went down. He preached the gospel. Amen. He came and he took back the keys of death. Amen. And he is resurrecting. And he is resurrecting things in your life. How many of you ready for that? And we're going to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. So um, don't think you're off the hook with church attendance because you were here on a Friday. That's what I'm trying to say in very theological terms. Amen. So we need both. And we are so privileged. We are so honored. And I am the most blessed man in the world because of my wife. And we are so blessed as a church that we have Pastor Gerda, who's really a prolific teacher of the Word of God. And she's going to share the Word this morning for our Good Friday service. So let's bring honor to the mother of the house as she's going to bring the Word. What? That's not how much time you've got. Make that more. <laughs> I'm just... Uh, I mean... Um, I don't know if the battery's going to last, last this long. It's, bro, it is so red. It looks like a taxi is going to drive over it any second. That's how red this light is. I think I've got a battery. Let me just check. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm just going to give to Pastor. Oh, all right. So I have as long as the battery lasts on this thing. Um, no, don't worry. I'm going to... I'm going to give you the word of God that I believe that is laid on my heart for you. Thank you for allowing me. And uh, um, I just want to, before I get into it, look all the ladies in the eye and tell you, please don't miss the 22nd of April. We're going to have a nice ladies fellowship here at church. So if you're watching from home, you're also invited to come on the 22nd just for a time of refreshing with your sisters in faith. And I will be there on that day as well. Okay, we're going to do this. Fantastic. So d does that mean that I now have my full time? <laughs> okay. This morning I want to talk to you about Christ, our Passover. And I got the title from 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7. It says there, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And this is what we commemorate on our Good Friday gathering, is that Christ indeed was sacrificed for us. He became our Passover. But if we don't understand what Passover is, how will we understand what Christ truly really did for us? And that is why I want to look at the Feast of Passover today. Because to me, one of the most powerful fulfillments of an Old Testament feast is that of Passover. So I'm going to give you a bit of teaching on Passover. So whenever you see in the shops also nowadays that Jews have their feasts and they say happy Passover, blessed Pesach or whatever, then you'll know actually that we as Christians can share in the beautiful meaning of that. So we don't celebrate Passover anymore the, way, the, the same way as the Jews do. We just take and see the beauty in that feast and we, say what, we see what Christ did to come and fulfill it and we apply that to our lives. So... For us to dig into this meaning of Passover, I want to tell you that Passover has actually got three parts to it. It's a feast with three parts. First, it is the Passover. Then it goes into unleavened bread, which lasts for... And if we don't look at all three of those parts of Passover festival, we will not truly understand the deep meaning of it. And you know what? I'm standing here, and uh, I'm probably there's a shadow of me coming forward from these lights. 
Now, if I ask my family, who would you rather hug, the shadow or me? I think, I hope it will be me. <laughs> yes. Now, in the same way, these feasts were a shadow. But who would you rather have, the shadow or the real thing, which is Christ? So the f that's why, I, but I have. Oh, sweet. So the shadow just pointed that there was something real. But the shadow wasn't the real thing yet. Christ was the real thing, and he's the one who came. So when we practice Easter, we are looking at what Jesus did for us. And now you might think, but where on earth does Easter come in? Don't worry, I'll explain the name thing just now. The practice of celebrating Easter developed through church history the same way that Christmas did. We didn't find it instituted in the Bible, but we as Christians, we celebrate these festivals and it gives us, us an opportunity to share Jesus with the world. So why not make use of it? We are pro celebrating Easter and Christmas because it puts the spotlight square Easter. Because it can, we can reflect on the meaning of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And Pastor Norman already gave you an ad break. Resurrection is coming on Sunday. So the feasts of Israel truly are beautiful, but we don't have to go back to the Old Testament way of celebrating them for us to benefit from their deep meaning. We can still benefit from their deep meaning because they were prophetic pictures of God's plan of redemption, and they were all fulfilled in Christ and His church. So today, let's, uh, we're going to just pause at Passover, unleavened bread, and the sheaf of first fruit that find their fulfillment in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. The physical elements, like a physical thing, they are symbols. And the actions that were, they did at these festivals were finding their ultimate meaning in what Christ did for us. So even today, when the Jews celebrate Passover, they call it a festival of freedom. Did any of you see any of those epic movies? Exodus, I know, came out some years ago. And some of us might remember the children's, the Disney classic, uh, Prince of Egypt. Passover is the culmination of the ten plagues. When the Israelites left Egypt, and then they were delivered from slavery. And Passover commemorates that transition from slavery into freedom. But just as they now remember that historical event in their history, the Israelites, we find that the fulfillment is freedom in Christ for us. We have been set free from a life of bondage to sin in Christ. So for background, let's just recap the history and go back to Exodus 12, where this all began, the very first time they were commanded to, to commemorate. And this was, there was kind of big build-up to this final plague because they had all these instructions of what they had to do to prepare for it. And this is what we read in Exodus 12, from verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be your first month, the first month of your year. One for each, each household. Then we see in verse 5, the animals you choose must be year-old ma males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or from the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they ought to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Now bread made without yeast, that's unleavened bread. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire, very specific, with the head, the legs, and the internal organs, the whole thing. Like we would say in Afrikaans, pens and poikis. <laughs> Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it with haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So all this was getting them ready. They have to be ready. Something momentous is going to happen. He carries on to say, On that same night I will pass through Egypt and I will strike down every firstborn of both people 
and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Do you hear it there? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. That's why even today the Jews celebrate Pesach. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly. And another on the seventh day. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. So that is where it all began. This festival was instituted. There was great significance in the timing during this original Passover, but also then in the timing of Christ's death and resurrection. So it's good for us to go back and dig into the word and see how the Passover festival was a picture of Christ to come and how Christ fulfilled that this, all that this picture foreshadowed. I can't read all the scriptures that there is because this festi- this hap- what Christ did is actually recorded in all four Gospels. So you can go and read the full account in John 18 to 20, in Matthew 26 to 28, in Luke 22 to 24. I'm not going to go into them, but the, that Passover week and the passion of Christ, that final day that he went through, is all fully recorded with all the details. I'm just going to refer back to it here and there. I'm sure you will remember from what you've heard and what we've read in the past. But before I dig into those scriptures, I just want to quickly talk about the word Passover. What does this word mean? In Hebrew, the word for this, um, for this feast is Pesach. And it gave, gives us the Greek transliteration, Pascha. Pascha. Now you might think, what on earth is going on here? Y- you know what a transliteration is? It's when there's a word, but you don't know how to translate it, so you just take the sounds and make it in your, your language. That's what the Greeks did. They just took the, Jew, the Hebrew word and they just gave it the same, similar sounds to what it would be in Greek. So that's how Pesach became Pascha. I hope I'm saying that correctly. I'm not Greek. But I know we get uh, references to those translations from Paschal Lamb. You know, that's a big word. We also have in Afrikaans, Pasphius. Then we have in other languages, they refer to it as Pasa. Pak Juiv, Pasco Judaica, Parson. So we hear that original Passover has been carried over into other languages. And what it literally means is to hover over, to pass by. And that's why we have the word Passover in English. When we, re- we see in Exodus 12, verse 12, it says, When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Remember, we just read that. And isn't that just a beautiful picture? It made me think of, have you seen these little birds? Colibri, I think they call them in English, in Afrikaans. It, they come and they, they hover at the plants. And then they drink from the, the nectar from the flowers. Now, it's almost like that hovering. And it says two things, you know. It's the Lord hover over, was hovering. And that is the beautiful me- meaning. The passing over. The angel of death couldn't go in because the blood was on the doors. Something had already died for that house. A lamb had died for that household. So the firstborn couldn't die because there had already been a death provided. So he had to pass over. So why do we have Easter then? Now, just to calm everybody down. We are not celebrating a pagan festival. (laughs) Easter comes from the Anglo-Saxon word from the Germanic Oster, which means in the east. Where the sun rises. I think that's this side (laughs) or that side. Where's east? Um, With all these curtains, I can't see where east is, but I think it's that side. And when the sun rises, it speaks of new life, a resurrection, a new day, a new beginning. So I think we can safely say we're just going to take Easter as coming from Oster, which means that it speaks of the resurrection of Christ. And we are not going to be tied down to any other debates about that. 
Because what we are celebrating is what Christ fulfilled when he fulfilled the, past, the Jewish Passover. So, now I'm going to break it down for you. And I hope you can keep up with me because this is where it becomes really, really good. First of all, in the Old Testament Passover, remember what he said? God told him, take a lamb on this day, the 10th day, and keep it aside for sacrifice. Now, if we were strict, we would have celebrated um, Palm Sunday, the past Sunday. And that is actually, remember, Jesus came into Jerusalem, and they had the palms, and says, oh, Hosanna, you know, wow, our Savior is here. And he came into Jerusalem. And what happened then? A week passed while he was there in Jerusalem, and he could be inspected. And everybody could see him, because that was, remember what the lamb had to be, what they had to do with the lamb? They had to inspect it without blemish. Year old lamb. Good for sacrifice. Remember, you have to give your best to the Lord. So now this week, they keep the lamb there. They see, okay, it's without blemish. It's meeting the requirements. Perfect. What did happen? Jesus is in Jerusalem for a week. He's teaching. He's speaking. In the open, everybody can hear him. Everybody can see him. He can be tested. He can be seen. Perfect, without spot, without blemish, without sin. Even when we went to the trial, and we watched the Passion of the Christ yesterday evening with our family, they couldn't find anything wrong with him. Pilate couldn't find fault with him. Herod couldn't find fault with him. Judas saw that he was innocent. Even the high priest of the day could, had to fabricate testimony against him to get him crucified. So he was found to be perfect, spotless, without blemish, just like the lamb. And then on the required day, the lamb must be killed at twilight. That was also a specific instruction. And when did Jesus die? On the day that he was crucified, late afternoon, he died. So, Jesus' crucifixion coincided with the... Because remember, they went to Jerusalem to prepare for the Passover. And that's why they had the meal together. And it was the preparation day. That's why the Jews wanted to get the crucifixion over and done with, because they wanted to go do their Passover. So actually... Jesus was crucified and he was in the grave over the exact festival of Passover that the Jews were celebrating. They said of the lamb that they had to kill at the Passover, not a bone was to be broken. When Jesus passed away on the cross, they came to him. They saw he's already dead. They didn't have to break his bones for him to die so that they could take him off. What did they have to do with the blood of the lamb? They had to apply it on the door. Now, the blood is so significant. And ever since the Garden of Eden, Eden, blood has been important. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God's always got something about blood. And I think it was all because Jesus' blood was coming. And we had to realize the significance of the blood. So first of all, the blood had to be shed of the lamb. They cut its throat. And remember, kosher law says the blood has to drain from the body. They don't eat meat with blood in it. So they would have had this little bowl of blood and then they could dip a branch in it and apply it to the door frames. So the blood that flew from the, the lamb means there's a death. Because if your blood drains from you, what happens to you? You're dead. And then the blood had to be applied. It had to be sprinkled and spread on the door frames. The blood also had to be there as a token for this to be effective. Otherwise, if there was no blood on the door, the angel of death would have not known there was a death for that family. He would have come in and someone would have died. So they, had, they were actually applying it by faith because the Israelites just heard they had to do this, but how did they, how did they know for sure it was going to work? They had to believe it. So even in the action of killing the lamb, draining the blood, applying it to their doors, it was an act of faith that they believed in God that said if we have the blood on the door, we're safe. And now let's look at what happened with Christ. When we receive Christ, the blood is applied to my life. So I'm sprinkled. First of all, there's evidence that a death has been died in my place, so I don't have to die. And then because the blood is on my life, it means destruction, destruction cannot come into my life. Death has to pass over me. It has to leave me alone. Isn't that just so amazing? And how do we apply the blood? By faith. Amen. We're not literally going to say, Jesus, <clears throat> send me a vial there from heaven. Sprinkle, sprinkle. No. 
We say, I believe in your faith, in your blood that was shed. And in that faith, that act of faith, yes, it is applied. Because this is, isn't this what our whole relationship with God is based on? It's based on faith. We enter into it by faith. We receive the sacrifice by faith. Now, what did they do with the body of the lamb now after the blood was used? First of all, there were very specific instructions again. <laughs> they had to eat it that same night. They had to roast it in the fire. And remember when Christ was on the cross, God's wrathful sin came out over him and he was roasted, in a sense, with the wrath of God. It says, don't boil it with water. We must never water down the gospel of Christ. We must always present it in its pure form. Also, they had to eat this meat with bitter herbs. Now, of course, coming out of slavery, that had a very specific meaning for them as well. But when we think of what Jesus went through on, on the cross, he went through that bitter experience of carrying our sin at the crucifixion. He had also experiences the bitterness of being rejected by everyone, being abandoned in his hour of need. And he did that so that we can know that he's always with us, no matter what we are going through. He took the bitterness in our place. Then they had to be ready to depart. Remember, they were standing eating with their staffs and their shoes on. They were like, we're not going to have a feast and then go sleep. We're ready. If God gives the signals, we're out of here. And that's when we receive Jesus, we are ready to depart from our old life. Why would I want to still be in my old life if I've entered into a new one? The one that he's bought for me. Then it comes to the unleavened bread. The instruction was, don't take yeast with you. Now, what does yeast represent? The biblical symbol of yeast, the leaven, was, is influence. Because where would the yeast have come from that they would leaven their bread with? From Egypt. And they didn't, God didn't want them to take anything from Egypt with them. Because remember, Egypt didn't serve the living God. Egypt had other gods. And he wanted them to leave that all behind. And that's why no leaven in the bread. Now, for those young youngsters among us who might not have ever had baked bread, if you bake bread, you put yeast in so that it rises and it's nice and fluffy and, and uh, um, big. If you don't put leaven in it, it's flat. You know, there's, there's no rise. It's just flat. And that's the difference between leaven and unleavened. And that, I think, is what the Lord also wants for us. When we receive Christ, we leave the old influences of the old life behind because all things have become new and as the israelites that evening were nourished and strengthened by eating that passover lamb we are nourished when we spiritually feed on christ and remember that at the whole thing the head the legs the inward parts when we feed on christ in terms of his truth and who he is and we read the bible what are we getting we're getting his mind He's getting his walk, his way of doing things that are in the legs. We're getting his inward motives and affections. So even that symbolized something that we now have in Christ. And remember, when they went out the next day, there was none feeble among them. We often hear this when we partake of Holy Communion. None feeble among them. And that is, means that they received healing supernaturally to make them strong for this journey that they were now taking on. And when... We receive Christ. Healing is available to us too. Physical healing in our bodies, but also spiritual healing, mental healing we receive in Christ, in our true Lamb, Jesus Christ. So when they instituted the Passover, it, it, God told them they have to do this as a memorial every year to commemorate their redemption, their, their deliverance from Israel, uh, from Egypt. And it's the same thing now. Jesus came and he instituted, on the evening before he was going to die, he instituted the Lord's Supper and he said, this is now the new covenant. And he told us to keep this in remembrance of him regularly, often. And that's why we at, at Unveiled Church, we do that, that often. And we're going to partake of Holy Communion today because we commemorate what Christ did for us often. as a lot. Now, after this specific Passover day, they go into a week of unleavened bread, where they say, for a week, I'm not going to eat bread with yeast in it. And this speaks of a consecration kind. And when we come to Christ, we, we leave an old 
lifestyle of sin and our old way of believing. And we set ourselves apart to Christ to live the way He wants, to adopt His thinking, to adopt His motives. And we can hand. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll come to Christ when, I, when I've sorted out a few things. You can, you're never going to sort it out. Because in our own strength, we just can't. We can only do it because He's in us. So we come to Him in our mess. We come to Him as we are. And He wants us to come to Him as we are. And He says, okay, thank you. And then we just surrender to Him. And then we go into our unleavened bread. In other words, we leave the other influences behind. And we look forward to new life in Him. Isn't that just good? I'm going to touch on the sheaf of first fruits, but I know Pastor Norman's going to speak about resurrection on Sunday. I just want to say how it fulfills this feast. Now, the sheaf of first fruits, I don't know if anybody ever heard of this festival. Because we know about Passover, we know about unleavened bread, but what's this, this sheaf thing now? <laughs> now, in those days, remember, it was an agricultural community. And uh, they didn't buy their food at the shops, they grew it themselves. And from Joseph, remember when Joseph had his dream and he said, oh, they were harvesting and there were all these sheaves and every brother had a sheaf and his sheaf was there and then their sheaves bowed to his. So we know that a sheaf symbolizes a person. And now what they did is this feast of she first fruits sp speaks of the harvest is ended and then they start harvesting. The first sheaf that's ready to harvest, they bring as a sacrifice to the Lord. To say, thank you, Lord, that you give, gave us the harvest. We acknowledge that we can only have our harvest because you're good to us. And then they present as a first fruits. And let's read in 1 Corinthians 12 what it says about the first fruits. 1 Corinthians uh, 15, actually, from 20 to 23. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and after those who are in Christ at his coming. Now this festival was instituted, and I'm not going to go read it to you, but it basically meant what I just explained. They would cut a sheaf, the first sheaf of the harvest, and they will present it to the priest who waves it in the presence of the Lord. And when? On the morning after the Sabbath. Now let that just sink in for a moment. There wasn't a specific calendar date actually set to this feast. It was just as soon as the harvest is ready, we bring in the first sheaf. And when is it presented? Not on the Sabbath. Not on an unusual festival day in the middle of the week. On the day after the Sabbath. And I'm getting goosebumps already. Because this found its fulfillment in Christ's resurrection on the morning after the Sabbath. And we saw now that he was the first fruit to be resurrected from the dead. As a representative of the rest. Because just as that sheaf is a representative of the rest of the harvest, so Christ, as the first one to be resurrected, is a representative of all the rest of us who are going to be resurrected with him into eternal life. Isn't that just beautiful when you see these old feasts from the Old Testament be fulfilled in Christ? And we can know that that now can apply to us. And I can tell you that today is Friday, but Sunday is coming. Sunday is coming. Now, how do we as Christians keep the Passover? We don't have to go back and now have to go slaughter a lamb and drain the blood and roast it on fire, eat it with bitter herbs. How do I, as a Christian, apply the fulfilled Passover feast in my life? Well, <clears throat> before we received Christ into our lives, we were all in a state of bondage. We were slaves, just like the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. In a way, we are slaves to sin. We are, are, are slaves to wrong thinking, to world, world system. But then when I give my life to Christ, I pass over from the old life to the new life. And that is how I apply Passover into my life. When, I get, when you get saved, 
you are celebrating the festival of Passover. And that is a perpetual truth in your life from the moment that you receive Christ as your Savior. So as Christ fulfilled the Passover that pointed to him, he gave us the Holy Communion to remember him. And this is also a meal. The cup is his blood. The bread represents his body. Remember the lamb that they sacrificed is a picture of Christ. The lamb pointed to the fact that a death was provided for that family so that no one in that family needed to die. Now Christ came and he provided a death for me so that I don't have to receive the punishment of death, that death sentence. I can be set free in him. I can move over into life. So when we receive him, his blood is applied to our lives. And we remember that every time we partake of communion and death and destruction has to pass over us. So when you give your life to Jesus, you've passed over from death into life and you've got his sacrificial blood spiritually applied to your life. So that is how we apply Passover into our lives. Let's read in Romans 3 verse 24 to 25. It says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that we had previously committed. He does not hold those sins against you anymore, because the blood is over them, so he can't see those, them anymore. Remember when Christ was on the cross, he took the beating, he took the death. That was the punishment for sin. And he took it so that you don't have to take punishment. But don't we sometimes still punish ourselves? Hey, we do. But today I want to come and give you the good news that you don't have to receive punishment in your body, in the form of sickness, or in your mind, yourself, because Christ took your punishment. The best thing you can do to celebrate Passover is to receive what he has done for you. It makes him so happy. You know, we don't want to see loved ones suffer. But then when they keep on, it's almost like they beat themselves up. Oh, I'm so bad. And oh, I did this. And oh, I did that. Jesus hated it when we do that to ourselves. Don't do that to yourself. When you realize you've messed up and you feel horrible about it, just come to him and pray and say, Lord, I messed up. Thank you. You already took the punishment for this mistake. And you remember what it must have been like on the cross. And his blood that was spilled, the beating he took. And you say, Lord, you took the beating for this wrong thing I did. You took the beating for this sin. Thank you. I receive what you did. And I let go of this guilt. Because you know what? The guilt's just going to trip you up more. It's not going to help you be better. Knowing that you're forgiven and that you are free, straight, the burden is off you. You can look forward and then live in line with the truth that you are forgiven, that you are free, that you are clean. If you keep on reminding yourself of your mistakes and your guilt, you will keep on in them. But if you remind yourself of the truth that you are set free, that he smiles over you, you're going to live a life that makes that true, that you are good, that you are right, that you are clean. So whenever we come to Christ in salvation, we keep the Passover. And when we partake of communion, we celebrate that Christ has fulfilled the Passover. And we should do this as a memorial, a continual reminder of what he's accomplished. It is fulfilled. He cried out on the cross and he said, it is finished. It is done. Don't try and do it again by yourself. He did it so that you don't have to. So this evening... Oh, this morning. Wow, time flies, eh, when you're having fun. <laughs> uh, this morning, I want to ask each and every one of you here and those watching at home, have you applied the fulfilled Passover in your life? Have you? You know how you do that? By receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. By accepting that he has fulfilled the Passover so that it can apply to you. So if you want to do that this morning, I just want to do a simple prayer with you. And if you are here this morning, I want to 
encourage you to pray this prayer out loud. All of us are going to pray it out loud so that you don't have to be shy. You don't have to feel singled out because all of us will pray it, even though we've prayed it a hundred times. But if you want to pray today out loud for the very first time, please do so. And just say, Lord, I'm going to apply this fulfilled Passover to my life because I cannot save myself. Only you can. Let's close our eyes and I'm going to lead us in this prayer. Let's say out loud, Lord Jesus, I cannot save myself. Sorry for everything I've done wrong. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross in my place. You took all the punishment for my sin. Please come into my life and wash me clean. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I apply your blood to my life. Now I belong to you. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your righteousness. Thank you, Father, that I am now a child of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now now that you've applied the Passover, let's partake of Holy Communion together because that really will just make it so real and so physical to you. So the ushers are going to hand out the elements and uh, our brother Mpo is going to come up and share the word for communion. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Gerda. That was a powerful teaching. Thank you. Good morning, church. Are you blessed to be here on a Friday? (laughs) all right so i have the honor and the privilege of sharing and breaking the bread today So Pastor Herra took us through the pass up by next. Yeah. Took us through the process. And I'm taking you past Friday, past Sunday. <laughs> Amen. Past Sunday, but remembering Friday and Sunday. Amen. So I've got a few thoughts just to share with you. The first scripture I'm going to read is from John 20, verse 25 to 27. It reads, So the other disciples told him. Him here is Thomas, right? You know him as Doubting Thomas. They are saying to him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my my finger where the nails were. You see, evidence that the crucifixion happened. Until I put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week after his, after his disciples were in the house again, the his, this part is Jesus. A week after the disciples were in the house again, Thomas now was with them. So the first time he was not with them. Now he's with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood amongst be with you. Then he said to Thomas, he didn't have to wait for Thomas, he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. So here the Lord is already telling us that the only evidence we have of him dying for us is the nail pierced hands in the side that pour out to give birth to the church so when the blood when he was stepped on the side he was actually giving birth to the church because what happens when a mother gives birth water breaks so what happened when they stabbed him blood and water broke out so the church was born So we do this in remembrance of what he did on the cross. So 
every one of us have that responsibility. But what, what was the second significance of him showing his hands or them nailing him to the cross? He was restoring what we lost in Eden. Because through the hands, as people, we are able to go around and touch. Through the hands, we are able to do good. Through the hands, we are able to build. But from Eden, because of what happened, there was a curse on the hands. Because God said, you will toil every day to man because of the sin that man committed. But when Christ was hung on the cross, pierced, they pierced his hands to do what? To restore. Because now he had to pay the price with his blood to the ground that the ground will no longer be difficult for men to reap from. So he restored the relationship that we lost and the work of our hands have been restored. Amen? So whatever that you want to do with your hands, God was saying from now on, because it's a new covenant, you will prosper. Everything that you will touch will prosper. Why? Because the hands were restored. Amen? If you don't believe me, let me read to you a quick psalm. Just a quick one. Amen? Which is Psalm 90 verse 17. It says, May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So God is estab has established the works of our hands. He has confirmed a blessing upon us that all our hands are supposed to yield fruitfulness. He has restored that relationship that we lost. So we are not going to toil in vain, but we are going to do what? We are going to use our hands now as restored hands that Christ paid the price for to bring us back into what God wants us to do. Amen? So that is the importance of him bleeding, them nailing him. And he was saying to Thomas, Thomas, stop doubting that I have made all things new. Stop doubting that I have restored. Stop doubting because this is the evidence that every believer will have. Whenever I come to you, know I have restored all things and we are in a new covenant because there's evidence that I am the Lamb of God. There is evidence. Amen? So, our scripture for communion, 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26, it says, For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For wherever, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So right now, our hands have been restored. And with this body, we know that whatever that we are going to do with our hands, it will prosper. So the Lord has already restored, removed the curse. We are no longer bound by the curse. We've gone beyond the curse. We are on a Monday after the Sunday. Amen? So if you believe it, say, I believe it. I receive it. Let's partake. And with the blood, he's saying, this is the new covenant that I have with you. A covenant of prosperity. A covenant of healing. A covenant of fulfillment. A covenant of joy. A covenant of peace. A covenant of of an everlasting, over-supplied and abundant good life. If you believe it, say, I believe it, I receive it. Let's partake. Let's thank the Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, we give you praise, honor, and glory. We thank you for what you have done for us in Calvary. We pray, Father, as we receive 
this communion right now in remembrance of what you have done. Holy Spirit, heal our bodies. Restore our fortunes, Lord. Take care of our tomorrow. And may our lives and our hands continue to be productive. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you so much, Brother Bo. Welcome to sermon number three for today. No, I'm just teasing. Wasn't that amazing? Amen. Listen, whoever says that women don't belong on a pulpit is really missing out. I find it interesting that the first person that Jesus revealed himself to after he was resurrected was a woman. And she went and told everybody else. Amen. Amen. We are really, really blessed. Thank you so much uh, for that word, honey. And then also, Brother Mpo, the work of our hands is restored. How many of you believe that? Isn't that a beautiful revelation? So that means there's no excuse for you, for you not to be blessed. Amen. So the next seven hours is going to be amazing as I take up the offering. No. The story of Easter is a story of giving. Romans 8.32, and I promise you I won't keep you long, like Kim Kardashian said to one of her seven husbands. I won't keep you long. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? How many of you have got a need this morning? A physical need? Well, God already gave you Jesus. So how will he not freely give you all things? Because if he gave you Jesus, but he's not giving you or providing your need, we are saying that your need is more important than Jesus which it's not. Amen? But God in giving us His only begotten Son modeled for us the way to, to the abundant life. And family, I know we've heard a great message, but just don't leave without catching this. This is going to change your life forever. Amen? Because God gave us Jesus, an abundance of grace was made available. to. He gave us a sacrifice his son. So here's the principle. Listen to me. Listen to me. The bigger the sacrifice, the bigger the blessing. Amen. The bigger the sacrifice in giving, the bigger the blessing. Listen to the wording here, family. God did not spare, say spare, his own son, but delivered him up. Do you think it was difficult for God to to give his son to die for mankind I love you but I won't give you my son come on right it must have been so difficult now think about it if God gave an angel he could have said no 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 I'm not giving my son these people are from the West Rand I don't really like them that much I'm, I'm just going to send them an angel I'm still going to give them something not giving them nothing. I'm giving them an angel to go and sort out their problems. Would we have received the abundance of grace if God gave us an angel? No. No. The sacrifice would not have been sufficient. God says, okay, I'm not going to give an angel, but I'm going to give them silver. I'm going to give them gold. You know, the streets are made of it. Sa uh, throne of sapphire. I'm going to give them all that stuff. You know, to pay for mankind. Would we have received an abundance of grace? No. The sacrifice would not have been sufficient. If God says, okay, they don't need that. Let me send them a lawyer. Everybody needs a lawyer at some stage in their life. Right? <laughs> you know? Let me give them a lawyer to plead their case. Same story. The sacrifice would not have been enough. Amen. So... The bigger the sacrifice in giving, the bigger the blessing or the return. So when we begin to understand this principle, 
we will and know that the work of our hands have been restored we will stop thinking in terms of withholding from our giving and start thinking in terms of generosity you know who withholds a poor person a person who think i don't have enough i must i must keep back if I don't keep this back, I'm not going to make it to the end of the month. Oh, it's getting so quiet. Everybody said amen to my wife, but now, but you know, isn't that true? It's a person thinking in terms of lack, I cannot afford to give, so I'm not going to give. We hear stories like, oh, the works of my hands have been restored. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Everything my hands touch will be blessed until it comes to giving. Luke 6 38 give and it will be given to you God assumes that you've got to give because he already provided to you through Jesus Christ give and it will be given to you good measure how many you can do some good measure press down how many of you can do with some press down shake it together come on shake that popcorn everybody you know make room for more running over will be put into your bosom for with the same measure that you use <laughs> it will be measured back to you can i get some amens everything about the story of jesus is selfless christianity is struggling family because we are not following the example of our heavenly father you know this principle expands socioeconomic status. It works for the rich and the poor. You know, for somebody in this room, giving 500 rand is sacrificial. For someone else, 50,000 rand is sacrificial. But the results will be the same in your life. The bigger the sacrifice, the bigger the blessing or the return. Amen? And just closing, why do you think God did it like this? Why do you think? Because God wants us to make the sacrifice first. Then the blessing comes. Jesus had to die by faith, so to speak, for people to accept His sacrifice. Because you can still reject His sacrifice. Amen? Why do you think God did it like this? Because when we give something sacrificially, family, family, it means it destroys greed in our lives. Amen. You cannot sacrifice and be greedy at the same time. Greedy means I hold on. I don't let go. Amen. Greed is wanting something for nothing. Sacrifice, family, is the antidote to greed. Think about it. Before I got married, there was one important person in my life. Me. And then I got married. Now it's not his money, her money anymore. It's only her money now. Right? Listen. Before I had kids, I had lost lots of cash flow. How many of you understand the term cash flow? Right? Now it's flowing away from me. Towards them. The cash is not flowing to me anymore. But you know what? I don't complain about it because I'm a father. And it's sacrificial giving. You cannot give sacrificially and be greedy. Family, I'm saying to you. That it's time for us to truly believe this revelation. The works of our hands have been restored. We are already blessed. And I want to implore you this morning, as God gave to us and He sacrificed His only Son, let's become sacrificially generous and build the house of God. Amen. Let's take our tithes and our offerings in our hand. Lord Jesus, thank you that this morning our hearts will be moved 
by the sacrifice that you've made on the cross of Calvary on our behalf, Lord Jesus. Now I pray for everyone who gives in this house that your blessing will overflow in their lives. Lord, that we will truly see that measure shaken together, pressed down, running over. Put it into your people's hands right now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. The usher is going to take up cash if you've got cash. If you don't have, listen, we've got um, card machines. There's snap scan. There's various ways that you can give. It's really not difficult. Amen. Then if you've responded while they're busy taking that up, if you've responded, family, to the Salvation Appeal, please go and grab one of these booklets from our ushers. It will explain the decision that you've made. And maybe you are part of the furniture and say, Pastor, I've heard that story already. There's a newsletter for you as well. There's also something for you to read. Amen? And all the news are in there. And then I just want to say, as your pastor, after the school holidays, we're going back to two services. Okay? So you and people you don't like can come to the same church. That's okay. Okay? You can just go to different services. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we want to give you an opportunity to, to come to church. Um, there's more than enough opportunity. Uh, we're going to have an 8 a.m. service and we're going to have a 10 a.m. service again. And it's really going to be blessed. And I want you to do something for me this coming Sunday. Bring someone to church. Each one, reach one. Amen. I'm going to bring people to church. Tell them about the good news. Are you proud of your church? Amen. Come on, and we're going to be a blessing in other people's lives. How many of you are glad you came? Amen. Just sit like this. I'm going to proclaim a blessing over you. The Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you. The Lord makes His face to shine upon each and every one of you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that as we go, Lord, into Saturday, we know Saturday don't last forever, for you have risen. And as we come together on Sunday again, Lord Jesus, I thank you that our hearts will overflow. And Lord Jesus, here is our expectation for Sunday, that your resurrection power will move in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Family, I do believe that. Tomorrow is not Monday. That's the good news. It's Saturday. But... The other good news is you can still come to church that day after. I believe God's resurrection power is going to hit this place like never before. I believe we're going to see miracles. Bring somebody who needs a miracle. If that's you, come. I believe God's going to do something in your life. Amen. Amen. Bless you guys as you go. Thank you.